these cells are dividing. Now, obviously, cell division is important because, for example, in my body, about 10 million cell divisions are occurring per second. Every second, I'm making two to three million red blood cells, four to six million white blood cells. Cells of my skin are being replaced, all the ones which are being sloughed off and making new hair, et cetera. So obviously, cell division is important for repair as we just maintain our body. But then also, all of us came from 23 chromosomes, which were in a sperm, which then fused with 23 chromosomes, which were in an ovum, to produce a new cell, a zygote, which had 46 chromosomes. All of us were microscopic once. But that one cell then divided by mitosis and became two cells, then four, then eight. And when we look in the mirror and see 100 trillion cells looking back, obviously cell division has brought us where we are. So I often ask my classes, so how do you feel about cell division? And usually it's a thumbs up. And then I say, well, what about these cells? Because these are cells of a breast, a breast cancer. They are dividing, but they are dividing in an uncontrolled fashion, which is now threatening the life of the patient. These are blood cells in a patient with leukemia. These are cells of a uterine cancer. So while cell division is essential, we must control it. If cell division occurs in an uncontrolled fashion, well, this is now potentially cancer, um, which is one of the major causes of death in the world. And cancer will affect an estimated one in four Americans. And so what causes cancer? Well, I'll be jumping back and forth in this video between how a normal cell controls its cell division and then what causes cancer for the reason that the two go together. <clears throat> Once you understand how a normal cell decides that it is time to divide and then go through the process of uh, interphase passing through G1 replicating its uh, DNA and S, and then going through G2, making divisions, uh, preparations for division, and then into mitosis. Once you understand that process, it then becomes easy to talk about cancer because cancer is where this process is now uncontrolled, where it's initiated when it shouldn't be, or you pass checkpoints. A normal cell does not progress through G1 until it is told you are you know, cleared to go through G1. A normal cell does not go from G1 to S until it is cleared or into M. So there are checkpoints which stop inappropriate um, progression through this uh, cell uh, cycle. Um, so just here is an uh, uh, example. Um, in the middle of uh, mitosis in the phase of metaphase. The uh, chromosomes are aligned along uh, the metaphase uh, plate. They then, um, they then do not separate uh, until uh, anaphase. Um, um, but this separation only occurs if the procedure has uh, and gone normally. So there needs to be the tension uh, on these microtubules indicating that if cell division were to occur, uh, that equal chromosomes would be pulled uh, to both poles of the cell. So this is a checkpoint. If one passes this checkpoint, if the chromosomes are not aligned properly, well, that is a problem because now you might have a, an abnormal number of chromosomes going to one of the two daughter cells, and this could then be a factor in cancerous growth. And so um, it goes hand in hand to discuss what normally happens. So for example, the microtubules aligning this way, and then cancer, because there's a checkpoint, this should not progress further if um, this alignment has not uh, occurred properly. And if it does, then that would be then a, um, a condition which would predispose us to uh, cancer.
So once again, these two going hand in hand. Cells express proteins. Proteins govern everything in, or almost everything in uh, the cell, including progression through the cell cycle. So there are proteins which tell a cell when it's time to divide and navigate this uh, pro uh, process. Um, but then this gets us into a discussion of cancer. So obviously then in cancer, something is different. Something is not proceeding normally. And to make our lives more difficult, what separates one cancer patient from another um, would uh, vary. Not all individuals who have heart disease have it caused by the same reason. Not all individuals who have asthma have the same physiology of the disease and the same with cancer. So the cancer patient number one, notice there are abnormal proteins in the nucleus. That's what was causing the cancer. Whereas the person um, on uh, the right, it was a cell membrane protein. So as I talk about what proteins govern normal cell division, then it then becomes obvious what could cause cancer. So here's a protein in a normal breast cell, for example, and while I'll mention a couple of different kinds of cancer, we'll focus on breast cancer. Um, so let's say it's one of the checkpoint proteins, one of the proteins which stops cells from dividing when they shouldn't. And here you look in a uh, breast cancer cell and you see that protein isn't there. So sometimes cancer patients are missing a protein that normal cells have that maybe keeps growth in check. Um, but then there might be other uh, cases where notice here there's no difference between these proteins. So here's a protein that's not involved in uh, the cancer. Um, um, but then there will be uh, examples where if you look at the cytoplasm here, while the normal cell doesn't have any protein expression or maybe just a little, the breast cancer cell has far more. So a cancer cell is different from a, uh, a normal cell. Maybe they're expressing proteins that they shouldn't. Maybe they're not expressing proteins that they should. Maybe the levels of protein expression are different. You know, its growth factors are not inappropriate, um, but it might be inappropriate to express too much, um, uh, too high uh, a level uh, of them very often some of these changes would result from mutation. Now, um, a, a discussion of the causes of mutation is perhaps a bit beyond us at this point. I have other videos on uh, that. Um, but there are lots of causes of uh, modifications to the genetic information in the DNA, which would then lead to changes in the protein, maybe a change in the protein sequence, maybe a protein that doesn't work uh, as well, or at all. Maybe a change which will cause more protein to be made or less. Um, these changes do occur naturally. They occur every time a cell divides. So the more times a cell divides, the um, more mutations which accumulate. They can be induced by x-rays which break uh, the uh, protein's backbone, or by ultraviolet light which cause neighboring nucleotides to adhere and thus be confused uh, for one uh, nucleotide. They can be caused by jumping genes. They can be caused by viruses. So there are viruses such as papillomaviruses, which can insert into the uh, DNA and disrupt genes when uh, they do. Um, and then things from heat, to reactive oxygen species, to chemical mutagens. Um, all of these can cause uh, uh, mutations. So mutations are certainly something we you know, need to consider. All of us are mutant at the moment of conception. All of us have well over, it has been estimated, a hundred changes to our a genetic information, our genome that did not exist in the body uh, cells of our patients. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, of our parents. So all of us have new mutations that our parents did not. And then during the course of our lives, the ultraviolet light, which we've been exposed to, chemicals which we've ingested, and then just natural mistakes that cells make when they divide, all of these have caused new mutations to occur. 
So with all of these new mutations, the question is, do any of our cells now have mutations which increase the likelihood that cells will divide without control? This could occur in our skin, in our large intestine, um, anywhere in our body. Once again, I was going to focus on breast cancer, a form of cancer which can affect men or women, but affect women at a much higher uh, level with perhaps one in eight American women suffering uh, from breast cancer at some point of their lives. What causes cancer? Okay. Let's watch this cell divide. It's not dividing. Oh, right, it wouldn't divide because it hasn't been told to divide. This isn't something that just naturally occurs. Cells are constantly dividing. They only divide when it is appropriate, when they are told to, this is controlled. So if you notice, there was a signal, a growth factor, which came from outside the cell, which bound to a receptor, uh, typically on the cell membrane for most estrogen, its receptors are inside the cell, as we'll get to. Um, so cells have to be told. So the growth factor, which is the signal, and then the receptor, which was uh, perceived the signal and related to the interior of the cell. These then were critical in telling cells to divide. And since there are occasions where we want to tell one cell to divide in the body, but not others, there are different growth factors. So there's epidermal growth factor for epidermal cells. There's nerve growth factor. There's um, fibroblast growth factor, et cetera. And there are different receptors then for all of uh, these. So if we're looking at how cells uh, divide, we want to say that a normal cell then responds to growth factors. Now, this you know, video is more on cancer, so how does that relate? Well, because if growth factors and the receptors for these growth factors are part of how normal cells divide normally with proper control, then obviously modifications, changes, mutations, inappropriate expression of growth factor or of their receptors could then be involved in cancer. So for example, mutations in insulin-like growth factor two receptors um, are a cause of liver cancer. In this video, I'm going to focus on breast cancer. Um, and while there are a number of signals for growth and receptors, which I can mention, the main one is estrogen. Estrogen is a steroid which is made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the main steroid in the body. But as you can see with these enzymes, which will come in and modify cholesterol, cholesterol can be changed into a number of things, including hormones. So a number of hormones are made from cholesterol, cortisone, um, aldosterone, and then also a number which are, are referred to as, quote, male hormones or androgens. Now, they're not male hormones because everyone makes them in their adrenal glands, like this one and the next one. So, you know, calling them male hormones would be uh, uh, not technically correct. Um, and so cholesterol can be changed into this uh, androgen, like androstenedione in uh, the adrenal glands, or it could be changed into, into testosterone. Once again, sometimes associated with males inappropriately because everybody makes testosterone. In fact, testosterone is the precursor to estrogen. You don't get estrogen unless you make testosterone first. Now, men make testosterone and can convert that into estrogen. So estradiol is appropriate uh, and natural in male bodies. Um, but in women, once again, estrogen, estradiol as the main estrogen, is made from testosterone by an enzyme. This enzyme, unfortunately, has a couple of names. It can be called aromatase, estrogen synthase, and others. You might have heard that. So aromatase inhibitors are one of the main uh, treatments for breast cancer patients. And this is why estrogen is a signal which tells breast cancer, uh, breast cells to uh, divide. If you can inhibit the synthesis of estrogen uh, by inhibiting that aromatase enzyme, which does the last step, uh, then that will send less uh, signal to divide to breast cancer uh, cells. And thus, some of us 
are genetically predisposed to cancer because we can have variations of some of those genes involved in that pathway. Just as we have variations with um, hair color genes or blood type genes or genes for height, uh, et cetera, there can be variations in enzymes which are making estrogen. So some of us naturally make more estrogen than others. Some of us can make estrogen in different sites of the body. So adipose can make estrogen. Uh, even if breast tissue makes estrogen, um, in normal individuals, not all of the breast cells. And so if one expanded the expression of estrogen to different cells, that could be a, a mutation, a variation, which would then increase um, likelihood of cancer. Now, estrogen is such a major uh, growth factor. And, and estrogen in other lectures that I give is nothing but positive. So for example, um, estrogen is very important in the maintenance of bone tissue. That's why the loss of estrogen in menopause can lead to osteopenia and osteoporosis. So estrogen, very in, in, important and, and, and great when dealing with bone mass. When dealing with the brain, estrogen protects against depression and a number of um, of mental disorders. So, you know, estrogen, you know, a very positive effect there. Estrogen protects against heart disease. Estrogen protects against acne. But estrogen does promote cell growth. So in this topic of breast cancer, estrogen is a potential risk. Every time cells divide, there's a chance that they uh, change uh, some parts of their genome. Mutations occur naturally, even without exposure to chemicals. So the more a cell divides, the more chances for mutations it has. So estrogen in promoting cell growth, then um, uh, the more estrogen that one is exposed to, male or female, the greater the risk of cancer because the more mutations which accumulate. So as an example, um, women who undergo more menstrual cycles, let's say they undergo menarche early or menopause late, that means they have more menstrual cycles, that's more estrogen, more cell divisions, and thus more chances for uh, mutations to occur. The opposite would be true of women who undergo late menarche and early menopause. They would have less um, estrogen, fewer cycles, and thus less chance to, um, uh, to build up mutations. Um, and so what causes breast cancer? Well, there are a number of things which can affect the age of menarche, from nutrition to exercise, weight gain, uh, leptin made by adipose, uh, gene variations in the hormone LH, and others. Um, menopause is affected uh, by a number of different genes, health, smoking, other factors. And so um, all of these factors, which affect some aspect of the timing of menarche or uh, menopause, could then um, uh, could then uh, uh, be uh, factors. Um, then there are other potential sources of estrogen, uh, even uh, other than one's own uh, body. Um, and so uh, some women, uh, especially if they were trying to treat osteoporosis, uh, they then take uh, estrogen as a supplement for estrogen replacement therapy uh, with the idea that this then tells cells to divide, which maintain the, um, uh, the bone mass that uh, they were accustomed to and that they need. Um, we can uh, ingest estrogen in our foods. So for example, milk has estrogen uh, in it. Um, now one could say, oh, well, hasn't milk always had estrogen in it? Um, well, the way that um, milk cows are kept, um, more of them are pregnant um, than say compared to say the 1950s. And so one could argue that uh, estrogen content in milk has increased, potentially increasing um, the amount of estrogen which we are exposed uh, to. Um, now, uh, lots of hormones can uh, be made. So, you know, I'll get back to estrogen in uh, a second, um, but estrogen isn't the only uh, uh, signal. So for example, um, some uh, breast uh, cancer cells are stimulated by other hormones like, say, prolactin. Um, that uh, prolactin, uh, you know, which can be made to differing levels in different individuals, could affect uh, tumor cell growth.
Um, unfortunately, one of the things that makes this hard uh, to study is that obviously um, uh, we vary. Not only do we vary from person to person, but cancer cells then are by definition different. By definition, they are not acting the way that they should. So for example, you could say, oh, well, progesterone in general inhibits um, breast cell growth. Uh, and so progesterone in general or progestins from uh, birth control pills should not cause breast cells to grow. Androgens should not cause breast cells to grow. And that is absolutely correct. But once again, because breast uh, cancer cells are by definition abnormal, um, then there are cases where a hormone which normally inhibits growth is now stimulating growth in this uh, patient. Leptin is made by adipose. And so as we gain weight, and weight gain is a problem in developed nations in the modern world, that's more signal for um, a hormone which often uh, uh, encourages more cell division in, um, uh, in uh, breast uh, cells. Um, so there are lots of hormones uh, which can be relevant to the conversation, um, get, but getting back to uh, estrogen. Um, unfortunately, estrogen receptors are what we call promiscuous in that not only do they bind to estrogen and then tell the cell nucleus, hey, I've just bound to estrogen, it's time to divide, but also they can uh, bind to other things that aren't estrogen, but which look enough like it that it triggers the receptor. So there are what are called phytoestrogens, chemicals from plants, all right, so we can ingest plants. Um, including uh, a few chemicals in soy or hops or alfalfa, um, which estrogen receptors then bind to and then tell the nucleus of the cell, hey, I've just bound to estrogen, it's time to divide. But actually it was not estrogen from the body, but rather an estrogenic compound. There um, are pesticides which are estrogenic. So the more of this chemical exposure one has, uh, the more cell division. And then there is an estrogenic compound in plastics known as bisphenol A or BPA. And so while it's in plastics, giving plastics, uh, you know, qualities that we like in plastics, when, you know, plastics are heated, say in, you know, water bottle in the sun or something put in the microwave, now estrogenic compounds could actually enter the food. And so the plastic in our containers could actually increase, you know, the commands uh, in cells uh, for cell division. Even though the skin, the outer skin is dead, uh, we do know that some of the things put on the outer skin can find their way into the bloodstream. And so some cosmetics and ointments and creams actually have estrogenic compounds in them. And so uh, breast cells in the interior of the breast could actually receive um, instructions from uh, uh, um, cosmetic uh, materials which are put on the outside skin. Um, antiperspirants obviously applied to the region of the breast and the armpit. And some studies have concluded that the upper outer quadrant of the breast, that which faces the, um, uh, the armpit, um, uh, is uh, a, uh, an area that has a higher than normal uh, number of, uh, of, of tumors uh, which uh, develop uh, there. Okay. So some cancers develop because of changes to signals. Maybe a patient is making too much of a signal in their own body, or maybe they're ingesting chemicals which are simulating the signal. But also the signals then have to be detected by receptors. So notice here, this cancer patient on the right um, is making too much signal. That's why their cells are dividing more than they should, too much estrogen, uh, let's say. Um, but in the next animation, um, you could also then have abnormalities involving receptors. So if a cell makes more than the normal amount of receptor, <clears throat> that could result in more than the normal amount of growth. If cells make receptors in areas which shouldn't, that would mean that cells um, would respond to estrogen, which shouldn't in, uh, in a normal person respond to estrogen. 
sometimes receptors mutate to the point where they inform the cell that, hey, we've bound to the growth factor, it's time to divide, even when they haven't. So this is a problem where this type of uh, receptor is sending inappropriate messages to uh, the cell. And so we're just beginning, there's more to it. Um, but hopefully you can see that you know cancer is going to be complicated because normal cells rely on signals uh, uh, to control their cell division, but those signals can change. You know, they vary from person to person and the environment can affect them as well. Uh, normal individuals rely on receptors to uh, take that message from the outside of the cell to the nucleus, um, but then there can be variations in that, mutant estrogen receptors, which will then bind to the DNA at inappropriate at times to simulate um, cell uh, division. The next step in controlling the cell cycle is once a receptor has bound to a growth factor, it then relays the message and often enzymes called kinases are involved. What I'm about to say, it's actually a really important, you know, short statement on how cells work. A lot of cell proteins have kind of two phases, either like on or off. And the determinant in whether a protein is on and say promoting cell division versus off and say it's inhibiting cell division is whether or not it has specific phosphate groups attached to certain amino acids, okay? And so if we were to attach phosphates to certain uh, proteins, that turns them on, all right? And now maybe, you know, a cell uh, begins the process uh, to uh, divide. Our genome encodes hundreds of these kinase enzymes which turn on proteins and then um, uh, lots of uh, phosphatases which turn them off. Um, and so it just turns out this is a very common uh, way of regulating cells. Why would I mention this here? Well, because we vary. We vary in our hair color and our blood type, but we also vary in our kinases, how much we make, where we make them, what, you know, the structure of these kinases. And so we vary in how we turn on proteins in our cells, and these variations can then cause cancer. The very first cancer-causing gene which was identified, the very first identified oncogene, was SARC, which was a mutant kinase. So turning proteins on by adding phosphates to them by kinases and taking phosphates away with phosphatases, um, this is a very important way of regulating uh, the cell cycle and appropriate cell growth. And mutations in kinases and phosphatases could then lead to abnormal um, a cell uh, growth. And so this is in general true of cancer, that mutations in kinases uh, have been identified in patients as causative agents, uh, agents in cancer, uh, but then also specifically in breast cancer, there are kinases uh, which in specific, um, uh, I'm sorry, I have a couple, you know, given here. Uh, there are specific uh, cases that in individual patients, you know, this patient's um, cancer uh, was uh, in part caused by uh, abnormal uh, kinases of uh, this type. Now, one of the difficult things in studying, you know, things like heart disease or cancer is that one heart disease patient varies from the next as far as, you know, the uh, causative agents, uh, the treatments which are... Um, uh, or uh, functional, uh, et cetera. And then the same would be true of uh, cancer. Uh, so not all um, breast uh, cancer uh, cases are the same. So for example, one person's breast cancer might be caused by making too much aromatase, which makes up too much signal. Someone else um, might uh, be affected uh, by a mutated estrogen uh, uh, receptor. Um, and then a third person, you know, here you can see SARC. Once again, that was the very first um, 
uh, oncogene recognized, or some of these others, like the MAP kinases, which work in a uh, series of, uh, of steps um, uh, that uh, different patients have then had mutations in these kinases uh, um, as being part in cause of their cancer. At some point, the kinases uh, not only send messages throughout the cytoplasm of the cell, but they reach the nucleus where they turn on gene expression. So if this is the DNA, DNA needs to have a protein stick to it, what's called a transcription factor, before the gene is activated and transcribed. So when uh, DNA is expressed, um, it then is um, transcribed, converted into uh, RNA. Um, uh, and so there are uh, proteins called transcription factors, which turn on genes, decide which genes should be expressed. Now, it's good to express the right genes. It's also good not to express the wrong genes. And so we, uh, we also need to then um, uh, oppose uh, uh, transcription. So not only are there proteins in the nucleus which are turning on the right genes, but there are also what are called tumor suppressor uh, proteins. Um, two big ones would be BRCA1 uh, and BRCA2, sometimes known as the breast cancer genes. Um, but then also P53, which uh, more than any um, uh, protein uh, uh, prevents cells from dividing when they shouldn't. So we have proteins which bind to DNA and tell them to uh, divide. And then we also have proteins which bind DNA, which stop inappropriate cell division. Um, so when there's cells which should not divide, there are you know, mechanisms which prevent that, p53 and BRCA being very important with breast cancer. And we vary. And so, for example, if um, we inherited from our patient, from our, from our parents, a mutation in, um, say, BRCA or a mutation in uh, P53, um, we have a lesser ability to stop inappropriate cell growth. Uh, and so therefore, we would uh, then have a greater uh, risk of cancer in our lifetime. Now, I just want to repeat that and then start to uh, sum up, um, because uh, obviously one could study this in greater detail, all right? Um, but for example, when someone is at a higher risk of breast cancer or is getting a test for breast cancer, they often look for specific genes. So for example, BRCA1 is a gene which greatly can increase risk of breast cancer. It's located at a specific place in a chromosome. It makes a specific protein that does a specific job. But if you change the protein, so for example, if there's a mutation which changes one amino acid in the BRCA protein, cytosine to an abnormal, uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a, a nucleotide in the DNA. Um, if a mutation in the DNA occurs, then this will change the amino acid in the uh, protein, all right, because and the abnormal DNA nucleotide then causes an abnormal uh, RNA uh, nucleotide, um, which can then change the amino acid order or sometimes cause the protein to end early or something. Um, and so a normal BRCA protein has an arginine uh, inserted at a certain point. Um, but you know, some people have a different amino acid. Some people have a protein which is too short and therefore it doesn't work and therefore it doesn't um, uh, function. Uh, now, this is a, a great you know, chance uh, to you know, uh, think about, you know, the relationship between the DNA on the chromosomes, the RNA, which encodes the protein, which then works in the cell. Um, but I'll focus on that a little bit uh, more in subsequent. Uh, so the big picture then is lots of different proteins are involved in cell growth. There are proteins which promote cell growth, tell cells to divide. There are proteins which tell cells not to divide, like BRCA and P53. These are tumor suppressor proteins. Um, so the cell division which occur is occurring in your body, it's not this random 
um, set of events, uh, you uh, control this at many levels. You know, the growth factors, the receptors, the kinases, the phosphatases, the proteins in the middle, which are in the nucleus, which are binding um, DNA, the transcription factors. And then there's other things involved as well, like um, whether because of white blood cells like this one, or just because of genes being turned on in this one. Um, we are so afraid of cancer that our body cells have self-destruct sequences. If um, something is going wrong, if a cell is behaving abnormally, then we can trigger what's called apoptosis, um, which is programmed cell death. It's kind of like a self-destruct switch. You tell a cell you're behaving abnormally, you should not divide, you know, you should die, all right, to protect uh, the body, um, uh, uh, from uh, cancer, all right? Uh, and so there's all of these ways which we normally control cell division. Um, but then the problem is, if there are mutations, then we might lose some of this control. And we may now have cells divide without control, all right? So they might have too much growth factor. They might not be able to stop growth at a specific part of the cell cycle, they might ignore a checkpoint, say one of the proteins like P53, um, which is functional at checkpoints saying, you know, you can't go further in the cell cycle until you, um, uh, you know, have met the right conditions. Uh, inappropriate cells can then go uh, past uh, that and lead to uh, cancerous, um, to cancerous growth. And all sorts of other things. I mean, just, you know, getting back to, say, deodorants, for example. Um, deodorants use aluminum salts, which are toxic. But you might say, oh, this is the outside of my skin. Who cares? But these can, you know, then work their way into deeper tissues. They can affect cells. And aluminum salts uh, then can cause cells uh, to then have abnormal numbers of chromosomes after uh, division. And if cells have abnormal numbers of chromosomes, you know, they have one too many chromosome three copies. They have one too few chromosome 16s. Now that might mean that they have now too much, you know, genetic information for growth factors that would promote, you know, growing uh, too much or too little uh, genetic information for tumor suppressor uh, proteins. So then even changing numbers of chromosomes um, uh, could uh, then uh, uh, lead to problems. So the big picture is this is multifactorial. Um, there are many uh, causes. So there's not just one cause of cancer. There's not just one cause of breast cancer. Um, there can be abnormal, abnormalities in any of these uh, stages. And then that's the threat. All of us have all of these mechanisms to control cell growth, but mutations anywhere in the body in any single cell could ultimately lead to uh, cancer, which would uh, pose a major health risk. Now, fortunately for us, one change typically does not cause cancer. Cancer. There are checks and balances. And so, for example, if you notice abnormal cells on your skin, like you have a mole, well, those cells weren't supposed to be doing that, uh, so they're abnormal. But if they're staying in place, well, then maybe that's the limit of the abnormality. Um, and, you know, and then you're fine. If you were to notice, however, that the mole was starting to change its borders, well, maybe, you know, instead of the initial, you know, uh, mistakes, now maybe there's a few additional uh, mistakes. It might not be cancer yet, but clearly, let's say a cancer needs, say, 10 mutations um, before it's a cancer which can spread throughout uh, the body. Well, you know, as it gets from three to five, you know, at a certain point, you might, might want to have a mole removed or in the large intestine, a polyp removed. This isn't a life-threatening cancer yet, but if it would take 10 mutations to get there, that polyp might be at four or at six. Now, while you might live the rest of your life without getting to number 10, you know, removing the polyp, removing, you know, the mole might be um, uh, better, you know, just as a preventative uh, uh, mention. Uh, measure. Now, some tumors are bad if, you know, when they stay in one place. So for example, if I had a brain tumor, even if it wasn't going anywhere, if it just stayed in my brain, nevertheless, it's putting pressure on brain tissue. I mean, it could kill me even if it just stays in one place. So even 
benign tumors, which are contained in one place by connective tissue. They're not going anywhere. Um, even they can be bad because they can grow to the point where they can put pressure, you know, on, you know, surrounding structures and disrupt what should happen. I mean, we're not supposed to have extra growths throughout our body. But the most dangerous cells uh, are those which can then travel, all right? So you have tumor cells which can break off the primary uh, tumor mass and then travel throughout the body through blood and lymph and then start secondary tumors. This process is what is known as metastasis. This is how a benign tumor then becomes malignant where it starts uh, uh, to spread. Okay. Um, and so this has just been a, a, you know, a couple of uh, thoughts on the multifactorial aspect of cancer, you know, trying to show that it is not one single uh, a thing and has a lot of causative uh, uh, measures uh, to it. And obviously, I have these and other videos which go through the individual steps in greater detail, um, if that is of interest.